<clears throat> I have a verse in the Gita that I thought we'd look at um, tonight. I was actually going to speak on this verse yesterday, but somehow when I sat down to lecture, I grabbed the wrong verse. Hey man, your legs look really dirty. Are they, are they tatted or is that dirt on them? Okay. Uh, it's not that dirty. Okay. All right, we're cool. We're, no, we're good. We're good. My eyesight is not phenomenal, and so I got a little worried. All uh, right. No, we're cool. We're good. We're good. We're solid. No problem. Um, I'm like simultaneously the priest as well as the bouncer, so I have to like wear two hats and make sure everything's kosher. Um, so... I was actually going to lecture on this verse yesterday, and I sat down and I just, I recited the wrong verse, and so I just decided to go with it. So my whole lecture yesterday was going to be a different lecture, but I just pivoted because I quoted the wrong verse, and I decided, ah, you know, say la vie, that's, it was meant to be, and so I just, so this is, you're good, just keep trying. Don't worry about it. You drove all the way down here. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I, so anyway, this was, I thought about this. It's not, it's not like I spent a ton of time preparing a lecture. But I think about stuff during the day, and then that's what I speak about. So, um, here's a verse, and we'll get into it in a minute, but we'll look at the verse first. I'm going to give you guys a real clean translation into English and then we're gonna then we'll go from there. Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam Tesham for them satata yuktanam for them who are always yoked bhajatam worshipping me Priti Purvakam, with love. For those who are always yoked to me through worship with love. Tesham for them, Yuktanam, of those who are yogad, Bhajatam, worshiping, Priti Purvakam, according to love, uh, Satata, always. For those who are always linked to me through love-laden worship, through worship conducted with love, through a devotional, loving relationship. Interestingly, the word bhakti, sort of our term for what we do, the term bhakti comes from the same root here. Bhajatam is the same root for the word bhakti. That's the word budj, which becomes bhakti. So for those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, to those who are yoked to me, or yoga to me, really, yukta means yoga in Sanskrit, to those who are yoga to me, united to me, linked to me, through worship with love. Tadami buddhi yogam I give them wisdom. Tadami means I give. It's in the first person, person present tense, singular. Literally means I give. So it's Krishna talking, he's saying, I give them. What do you give them? Buddhi yoga. I give them that. I give to them. I give, that, I give them that. Buddhi yoga. Buddhi yoga means... Buddhi means enlightenment. It's where you get Buddha from. And so I give them Buddhi or you know, 
enlightenment, and like I give them the yoga of enlightenment. It means I give them the enlightenment so that they can connect with me. Yena mam upayanti te. And by that, from that, yena, by that enlightenment I give them, upayanti te, they are able to approach me, they're able to go to me. For those who are yoked, yoga to me, with love, worshiping me with love, you good? Yeah? Okay. For those who are yoga to me, with love, who are yoked to me, connected to me, linked to me, through worship, with love. For those people, I give them enlightenment by which they can come to me. That's the verse. This verse is part of four verses that are stated by the commentators for the last thousand or so years to communicate the entirety of the Gita's message. This is the third of those four verses. The verse is best understood in context, but we're not going to do the context today. We're just going to look at the verse as a standalone. So, here's Prabhupada's masterful translation. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So, what are your thoughts on the verse? Did you understand the verse? Kalpesh, did you understand the verse? Leela, did you understand the verse? Kim? Yidi? I did a good job of translating it? Okay. So, given that you all speak English, and that I did a good job of translating the verse, I translated it half a dozen times or so, now that it's been translated, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. You think that it's interesting that Krishna gives knowledge of how to approach him to people who are devoted to him instead of instead of like what you did with Christian understanding, which would be uh, the opposite in a sense. You've totally bewildered me. It might be because you're talking to me through a mask and I'm busy trying to come forward a little bit. I can I'm not gonna do this with anybody else. You guys can just bark at me from where you sit, but you, you can just say it loud so everybody can hear you. You think it's interesting. Now, interesting is a totally vague term. Like, interesting can mean I don't believe you and I think you're ridiculous, or interesting can be it's really cool. It depends on how you use it. So I don't know what to make of your usage of the term interesting, but your statement that you think it's interesting that God enlightens those who are devotionally inclined towards him Whereas in Judeo-Christianity, God enlightens the people who hate him? <laughs> no. Uh, it's almost like in Christianity, you would have to... Hey, no crosstalk, fellas. We're out up here. Go ahead. There's this idea that to know him is to love him. You make sure our fine feathered friend finds his way out? Okay. Sorry. I didn't think it was the crosstalk was coming from you. Am I correct? Yeah. So I, I figured I was just doing you a favor. Um, now I understand what you're saying a little bit. So in Christianity, God enlightens those who don't know him. And then through that enlightenment, through the gospel, 
Beauty, don't be, just be super chill. Yeah, I know, but just be super chill. Like, just poke your head in. Don't get all menacing. There was this weird phenomenon that happened. We, when we used to go out and chant in the streets, I was a security guard at like the age of 17 when I was 140 pounds soaking wet. Somehow I was given the job of being a security guard. And so we would go out to protect the devotees who were on the street doing our, really what was quite similar to the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army, when I was a kid growing up and I was in the Boy Scouts, I was a Boy Scout, and we would go camping, we'd sit around a fire and we'd sing songs. And so, one of the songs we would sing is Salvation Army, Salvation Army Put a nickel in the drum Save another drunken bum Salvation Army Who's got a joke? You guys, any of you guys understand this? Put a nickel in the drum Save another drunken bum Do you guys understand the song? This is, you know, the sectarian <laughs> bigoted songs I sang as a wee lad in the Boy Scouts. <laughs> are you guys from the Salvation Army? What do they do? I'm getting confused and mildly disturbed by you guys at this point. They help the poor. They help the poor. How do they help the poor? They just w walk around and hand out money to poor people? You guys aren't familiar that the Salvation Army is famous for collecting clothes and things that people are going to throw away and they have boxes all over the country and then they have a Salvation Army thrift stores where they sell things for pennies. Why are you all nodding your head yes, but a moment ago we were playing some kind of game of poker. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, all right. We're getting somewhere. Okay, and, and I get it now. All right. Okay. The Salvation Army in this country is famous for its thrift stores. Thus the bigoted and derogatory remarks in my campfire songs I sang growing up. Put a nickel in the drum, save another drunken bum. Who's got a joke? And then anybody in the, in the group could then, you know, jump up and tell a joke. You follow? The Salvation Army wasn't originally like that. The Salvation Army was a somewhat radical, turn-of-the-century Christian group that used to go out and do kirtan on the streets. They consider themselves to be conducting a revolution, which is why a priest is called a captain in the Salvation Army. And you go up through the ranks, it's called an army, because they had this kind of militant Che Guevara, Fidel Castro thing, but for religion. And they used to go out, there's a, there's a verse in Psalms that says that the, in the this is in the Hebrew Bible, going all the way back to the Hebrew Bible, that in the coming days of darkness, the devotees of God will play drums and cymbals and chant the names of God in public. And they took that seriously. And they would go and do kind of a Christian kirtan thing on the street, walking down the street in London and also then in the U.S. I believe they, had their, 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 they got their start in London and England and then they moved over to the U.S. I'd have to double check my math to be sure. But they, that's how they started. Then they underwent something called mission drift, which is the bane of every religious organization, that they got off topic and they became synonymous with thrift stores. But they were originally a really radical organization and then they eventually they, they had buckets and they collected change around Christmas time and, and they gave rise to a whole host of imitators of people who would just go out and collect at Christmas time for themselves. But you know, that, that's, where they, that's where they came from. They would beg in the streets and do kirtan. Wild, right? I 
I don't know how I got onto that. Can you help me? Yeah. Oh, you're like my hero here. Thank you. So we go out and chant in the streets. Not so different from the Salvation Army. But then people would accost us in the late 80s and early 90s when I was coming up as a young Hare Krishna. So we would have security guards who would keep their eyes on the devotees so that they didn't get assaulted and blindsided. And I was part of that detail. And there were certain configurations of security guards where every single time we would go out, we would end up getting into some kind of a melee. Like every time particular configurations of our security team would go out, fights would break out. And I, th I think we realized at a certain point that the people who were part of that team, they liked to fight. And so they created the discord by menacingly looking at people the whole time the devotees were chanting, and eventually they would menacingly look at the wrong person. It would become a, a game of, what are you looking at? I'm looking at you. What are you going to do about it? Well, what are you going to do? And it would turn into a fight. And when we stopped having security teams go out, then the fight stopped. Does that make sense? When we just sent the poor devotees, the vulnerable devotees out on their own without any, you know, any protectors, then it was peaceful. <laughs> because we were bringing the drama as opposed to protecting them from drama. Does that make sense? I don't know how I got into that. It seems like a pure tangent. You want to help me? I was talking about what? Mm, is that where it came from? No, I think that was the very beginning. Did I roll into that one? That was where it was from? You're like my hero. Multiple times over. Yeah, it seems like I play bouncer. And I think I'm, I'm good at it now. I don't have to like get up anymore. I can just, from, sitting from a chair, I can disrupt his equilibrium enough that he floats out. Was he okay? You dealt with him? I appreciate that. Um, in Christianity, there's this idea that we educate the people about God and then they fall in love with Christ. We spread the gospel. I think I got to it from spreading the gospel. And so we spread the gospel, the good news. We go out and share our faith with other people. And then they develop faith in our revelation and our tradition. Whereas this verse seems to subvert that. And you have to love God already in order to become enlightened. Correct? Okay. So that wouldn't be interesting. It would almost be more like a doubt and a question mark because it doesn't make sense. Did you follow that? There's a move in, there's a move in, in philosophy that sometimes there's, there's no causation, there's no explanation of first causes. David Hume was of this opinion, but there's also a lot of scientists these days who argue for the same thing, that looking for first causes is a fool's errand. But anytime you come up with an explanation, Ultimately, you're pointing to causation. I disrupted that person's life heirs because he was being unruly. The word cause is within the word because. Anytime you say this happened because of this, you're saying that caused this to happen. Literally. And so causation is at the core of any explanation for anything. It's at the core of science, which attempts to find causes. 
whether they're first cause or second cause of it is, is another question. Um, did you guys follow that? Did I lose you there? There is a move in science and in philosophy to say that there are no first causes. Did you understand that? That everything is just in a great chain and there's no real causes and things are just happening according to repeated patterns that go on with no particular cause. It's a sexy move in philosophy and in science. Did you follow that? It seems pretty simple what I said. Point number two. That doesn't really work because anytime you give any explanation for any phenomenon and you say this happened because of that, what are you ultimately saying? What is a first cause? A first cause would be like at the origin of the universe. Like a cosmological first cause, like a Big Bang. But you're saying there's some kind of cause. Did you follow that? And so this idea that you know there is no causes and there's only repetitive patterns of behavior. It, it, it's actually an untenable position. And even in our ordinary language, in our regular discussion with people, we seek to come up with causes for things. Did you follow that? Okay, now you have scientific determinism. And this would be like classical physics. So classical physics is, you know, how big objects move. It's like gravity and such, right? So if a Humean philosopher was to say, you know, why is this rock falling? Because other rocks have fallen. And so there's just, it's just, it happens. It's like there's a repetitive pattern. No, the rock falls because gravity is attracting those rocks to the earth because the Earth exerts a gravitational pull on all the things within its orbit, uh, within its, um, what's the term? Gravitational field. Yeah, within its gravitational field. I was thinking of another term, but yeah, that'll, that'll do just fine. Within its gravita I mean, its gravitational field is ultimately, in, in some sense, limitless. It's just minute, microscopic, um, but perhaps not non-zero, but within the, what do you call it? Atmosphere, within the Earth's atmosphere. But maybe it's not that. Maybe actually it's gravitational pull extends beyond this atmosphere. I don't actually know the answer to that. Anyway, the Earth is exerting force on those rocks, and they fall, and the other rocks fell before them because of gravity. Do you see that? That's causation. That's the core of science. It's the core of philosophy. You look for explanations of things. You follow? Now, if you look at something like classical physics, in classical physics, um, if you understand the first conditions that space, time, and matter exist, you follow? Or from a quantum perspective, a strong and weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, and gravity exist, whatever. Whatever way you want to, whatever way you want to try to describe your first causes, strong and weak nuclear force are what causes uh, decay through radioactivity and what causes, um, atoms to be held together. Strong nuclear force holds atoms together and weak nuclear force causes things to decay. And so when you're dealing with things on a quantum level, very small level, below that, generally below that of a molecule, um, on an atomic level, then a different set of rules apply. And that's quantum mechanics, or quantum physics. Larger than the molecule or with larger objects, then um, you have classical mechanics that governs the movement. Did you follow this? Did you follow that? Did you follow that? Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you're right, just absolutely following me with no problem whatsoever. That would be not absolutely no problem whatsoever. One guy in the room. Okay, I'm gonna totally abandon the line of reasoning I was going down. I'll just say it real quick. You're not going to follow it, but there you go. No problem. Classical mechanics is deterministic. If you understand the first conditions, whatever they're starting with, space, time, and matter, and you understand all the forces at play, then you can determine what's going to happen with certitude. Quantum mechanics is non-deterministic. It speaks in terms of probabilities because the quantum world is not deterministic. You can't predict for sure what's going to happen. You can only predict what's going to happen in terms of probability. You don't know, you know why a radioactive atom is going to decay in due course of time, but you don't know when exactly it's going to decay. 
there's a, a certain degree of um, non-determinism at play in the quantum world, which of course is what makes up everything that we experience. This means that reality consists of some non-deterministic factors, and therefore a good explanation doesn't always have to be something that you can straightforwardly deduce from prior conditions and the forces. Sometimes a good explanation is what is a, poss a possibility or a probability, but you don't have to have absolute certitude. And it's interesting, a lot of times amongst atheists or scientists, that they'll expect you as a theist to live up to this incredibly high level of determinism where your explanation has to be perfect, where it 100% with certitude in like a deductive logical way, in a syllogistic way, proves without a doubt what happens. Whereas in the quantum world that we live in, or in our belief in other people being conscious, we have all sorts of analogous ways in which we arrive at those beliefs and we think those things are perfectly reasonable. But we don't extend that same courtesy to theology. And therefore, when you're looking for a good explanation for things, it's not always that it has to be that this necessarily had to happen. That does happen sometimes with classical mechanics. But even in the physical world, on a quantum level, it becomes non-deterministic. And therefore, you should not fault somebody if they have an explanation for something within a given field where you would not expect absolute determinism. Did you follow that? So, you essentially brought up a fault in Krishna's presentation. Your fault was, Krishna expects you to have faith in him and love him before he'll enlighten you. And that's a fault. Because how would you surrender to God reasonably? You follow? And so we need, we need to overcome that fault and offer an explanation. So here we go. One explanation is fairly easy. Two verses earlier, Krishna says the source of all creation. Therefore, if you look at the world and see all the beauty in the world, and see all the truth in the world, and dig through the superficial appearance of evil and suffering and chaos, and you're able to see the truth and beauty in the world, then naturally you will love him. There's to know him is to love him. That happened beforehand then armed with that precursor knowledge of divinity that gets you started reasonably, so you're not blindly faithful, you now step into a realm where you begin to offer your love to Krishna freely, like somebody does, like these two, these two crazy kids just got engaged today. We can give them a round of applause. So uh, if I ask, if I ask Narayan, are you sure she's the one? He's going to tell me, yes. But the truth is, he can't be sure she's the one. Because love and trust and anything in this world isn't based on certitude per se. It's based on being vulnerable. Certain things should be there, so you're not just an idiot falling in love with somebody at a bar. Not that any of you would ever go to a bar. Certain precursors have to be there, so you're not just throwing yourself at some random person at a bus stop. But beyond that, there is always an element of chance and trust and vulnerability and openness that's a part of any relationship. a world filled with only determinism would suck. <laughs> we don't even think we live in such a world. And so we think in terms of probabilities. We think in terms of likely outcomes. We decide where we're going to hang our hat and who we're going to partner with and how we're going to move forward in business, in life, in friendships, both platonic and romantic, with our own kids, honestly. So, if Krishna demanded our fealty a priori before giving any knowledge whatsoever, that would be a fault. I think you would be correct that that was a fault. However, for Krishna to put us in a world where we are conscious and that consciousness does not tally with matter and it forces us to go, what is this whole consciousness thing? It seems to be this irreducible 
antimatter thing that has features that are supernatural. And I experience it at every moment. And that is perhaps the most undeniable evidence that exists. Rene Descartes famously said, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. I, I and many, many philosophers and scientists and physicists, not just philosophers, think that that's the most undeniable statement in the world. If you're doubting whether or not you exist, you have to exist in order to have that doubt, and you just proved that you exist. You follow? Some people say that's the only undoubtable thing in the universe. The only thing that a skeptic can't attack. Krishna built us into a world with that. That gets us on that journey. Now, and I'm just going fast because I'm not in a debate right now and so and I got I got I'm on a clock but if my consciousness is non-material then it must have a, a, a non-material source and therefore the singularity of the Big Bang or the initial causes must also include consciousness and a conscious cause of everything also is also known as a God and I start to look at what's most sustainable in this world and what's the best in this world, and I find the goodness and compassion, and now I arrive in all good God, and now I've arrived in all good deity that I can love and worship. Once I accept that God's a person, now our relationship becomes, to some extent, non-deterministic, in that I'm actually engaged in a loving relationship that naturally involves love and trust, as any significant relationship does. And so what Krishna really did in these verses and you caught the fault in this verse as a standalone, which forced me to go back two verses. But Krishna gives us something that we can hang our minds on and our intelligence on, that we can use to think deeply about the nature of reality, which can lead us to theism. Now, if it had to lead us to theism, and there was no way to doubt it, it was an absolute surefire argument, then free will goes out the window, and now God's not all good because he put us in a universe where we're forced to submit to him because there's no way to live in this world without realizing there's an all-seeing eye looking over you at all moments, and now we all become slaves. Did you follow that? But he gave enough that anybody who wants to look can find enough of a reason to begin to experiment with that hypothesis of spirituality. Once we have a hypothesis, now we can start to assume hypotheticals, and we can yoke ourselves to God through love in order to achieve a further relationship to depth. You follow? And so really what we're getting here is Krishna saying, I'm going to give you some first conditions, namely that consciousness exists. That's going to... It's going to be like a, like a bug in your ear or like a, a splinter in the mind's eye. And it's going to make you think about, well, what's really going on here? Why am I just chasing after material things? when it seems like fundamentally I'm not just a material being. And you start to go down that rabbit hole. You take that red pill and you go down that rabbit hole. And pretty soon you've got a God and an all good and all powerful one at that and those things are perfectly reasonable and now you can start doing spirituality. Now you can start investigating well, what does that relationship look like and you can begin to jump into some hypotheses. And that's where we are now in this verse in the Gita. And Krishna says, if you turn towards me with love, I will give you enlightenment. You can't do it on your own. You can't build a stairway to heaven. You have to get started. It's synergistic. You need to be part of it, and I need to be part of it. But there's some grace that comes here. And that grace happens before you reach perfection, at an intermediate stage. And that's why devotees have experiences, and people in all traditions have experiences of spirituality. And this is what I want to talk about. I am unashamed to admit that I've had revelatory, miraculous experiences in my life. It's not my first opening gambit. 
because then I sound like a fanatic Christian who's just blindly following. And people go, well, what if I had opposite experiences? And who's right? And it becomes a, you know, a, a testimonial thing. So I don't want to do that. I want to put down some principles. And so I go slow. And we establish what a good conception of divinity looks like. And just because we go beyond empiricism doesn't mean we can't do good philosophy. Just like because you go beyond non-determinism beyond determinism into a non-deterministic quantum world doesn't mean you can't do good philosophy. Doesn't mean you can't figure out anything. Doesn't mean those things don't have real world implication. But when you get down into some high level stuff, it's not always a simple two plus two equals four. It goes beyond logical deduction when you get into a real relationship. How do you know that she loves you? How do you know she'll always be there for you? How do you know it was the right bet to make? How do you know that you should spend a bunch of money on a ring? How do you know that he's the one? You don't. But you did enough work and you're like, I think this is what I think it's gonna happen. We're gonna move forward now. Sometimes people are hundred percent sure. People are always hundred percent sure after like a month. They're like hundred percent sure this is the one. What do you do? You just wait a couple of years and watch what happens. You know? Every snot nosed brat is 100% sure about everything. And then, you know, you wait five years and they come back and they go, oh, I was an idiot. I made a mistake. And you're like, yeah, I tried to tell you that, but you wouldn't listen. Um, we live in a non-deterministic world, even from the point of view of physics. And so that doesn't mean we can get away with anything. That doesn't mean that you can say any damn nonsense and have it pass as philosophy or have it pass as reasonable. But it does mean that if you want to talk about what constitutes warrant, what constitutes reason, what constitutes an explanation, it's not always that automatically by knowing the first cause and the forces, you arrive at the conclusion. Uh, you could know the first cause of the universe, which we do. You could know the forces, which we do. And there's no way, based on those things, you would ever predict that consciousness would arise. It's perfectly reasonable that you could have a universe with all sorts of chemical beings and even life totally devoid of consciousness just going on automatically. Consciousness is this almost like a red herring. You know, Einstein was once writing to the wife of one of his colleagues who died, and he was trying to, you know, was trying to be compassionate, but being Einstein, he wrote, yes, the passage of time is one of the most persistent illusions that vexes us. <laughs> you mean like you grow old and you die, but really we're space-time worms, and time is just an illusion, but it's one of the most persistent of illusions. He was trying to make the woman feel better by saying that actually your husband never died, he always existed as a space-time worm in four dimensions. But somehow it's this really persistent one. So is consciousness. And so there are certain things where we give explanations, and those explanations are quite rigorous, and they're, 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 they're very, very valid and almost necessary conclusions. But as you get up into the higher realms of spirituality, there's more room for trust. Just like when you get into a relationship with a person, at a certain point, you trust them. Like early on in a relationship, if your spouse like, stays out all night, you might get freaked out. You might get scared. You don't know them well enough. Maybe you think maybe they're cheating on you or something like that. Later on, you, you know them, and you know they would never do that to you, and so they stay out all night, you know there must be some explanation for what happened. A lot of times, people don't have relationships that have that degree of depth for them. One of our prayers is, Krishna, whether you embrace me or break my heart by disappearing, or whether you trample me underfoot, it doesn't matter. I'm going to offer you my love and devotion forever no matter what. 
generally speaking, if you look at most religions of the world, the devotee is the X factor. God's relationship is the constant. The devotee is the variable who may stray from the path. Thou shalt not worship other gods. And like this, you know, even in the Hebrew Bible, it says you should not be a whore and cheat on your husband who is God. And so it uses the example of an unfaithful woman to refer to us, and then God is the faithful husband. That's in the Hebrew Bible. Our tradition subverts that and looks at the devotee's love as a constant. Of course, it also looks at Krishna's love as a constant. But Krishna's love is therapeutic and it helps us to grow. And it's not always confinable to a box. And generally, receiving Krishna's love means undergoing a real hero's journey and a transformation. And old age, disease and death even become part of that. They help loosen the shackles that bind you to this world so that you can finally step out of this body and go back home. And even the lack of a fully deterministic argument for God allows us to have free will. But enough evidence there to start us on our journey if we wish to be. And so you find early on Krishna gives a a pow more powerful argument about who he is to get you started on that journey. But then later on, enough trust is developed and the devotee freely offers their love to Krishna. This happens in developmental psychology around the age of 12 when a child begins to have friendships which aren't based on rules and give and take, but they're based on seeing the other person happy and having that be enough. And so you find in, 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 in adult relationships which occur for children around, around adolescence, that they start to find happiness in seeing the other person happy. And they do for the other person just because they care. So what we have here is an incredibly personal conception of divinity. And we've been given some evidence on the front end which would fulfill your criteria of, 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 of knowledge preceding devotion. But then there's still this intermediate level where we have to step forward and we have to step into that hypothesis and we have to try it out and that trying it out, you know, if you want to love it, if you want to do a good science experiment, then what do you do? You buy US pharmaceutical grade ingredients and you conduct the experiment exactly as it's supposed to be done. Your feeling or your emotional state is irrelevant to a large extent. If you want to have a loving relationship, your feeling becomes part of what has to be there for the experiment to be successfully conducted. Did you guys follow that? What I said made sense, but it seems like you guys were spacing out. Did you follow that? If I'm doing a science experiment, does it matter how I feel? No, it does not. If I do the experiment properly, that's all I have to do, correct? However, if I'm in a relationship is how I feel and my sincerity, is that a factor that the other person is going to pick up on? Absolutely it is. And therefore, in the experiment with divinity, our sincerity is a reasonable criterion to say has to be in place. Did you follow that now? And I guess the point I was trying to make was this. Once you overcome the beginnings of spirituality and you show that belief in something higher is warranted and you can explain it in a sense of showing that it's the product of some reasonable investigation, it has just some reasonable evidence to support it, even if that evidence is not fully deterministic and even if it, you're going for a probable explanation or the best explanation, just like in court. In court, if you're in a, a criminal trial, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, which is usually like 99.99%. But then, in kind of medium things, uh, like a, a custody hearing for a child, they'll do a different standard of law. They'll do something called clear and compelling evidence. That's usually 80%. Then in a civil trial, it's a preponderance of evidence which means exactly 51%. So there's three different kinds of requirements for evidence to decide three different kinds of trials because in certain circumstances, you shouldn't be required. 
to offer something which is 99.99%. You follow? And this is also true in science, it's true in legality, and so when we're doing philosophy, when we're doing theology, when we're talking about our belief system, we should understand what the burden of evidence is that, that we have. We should understand what's reasonable evidence to expect from us. And we shouldn't let people hypocritically force us to follow like a massive standard of evidence that they themselves in their own philosophizing don't follow. Once we get over all that, and we get into the realm where we have a decent hypothesis, then it's totally reasonable to invoke a sensus divinatus, which is a term from John Calvin, a divine sense. It's perfectly reasonable to talk about your conscience. If God exists as a reasonable hypothesis, then it would be reasonable that we might have some faculties for perceiving that deity. And therefore, investigations into what that looks like would be reasonable. Looking for similar conclusions amongst billions of people all over the world in terms of how to best cultivate that relationship. Noticing that the Salvation Army and the Hare Krishna movement both radically go out in the street and do kirtan. And it was even written about in the Hebrew Bible that if you want to understand an all-good and all-powerful God, what should you do? You should just cry out. You should call out to Krishna. You should just not even ask for anything. No prayer even. No give us this day our daily bread. Just cry out. And then see what happens. Empiricism, naturalism, the idea that foundationalism, the idea that you know, the only thing that should be accepted as building blocks for philosophy should be those things which are self-evident, incorrigible, and um, uh, empirically demonstrable. That theory about the nature of the world itself isn't empirically demonstrable or self-evident or incorrigible. For instance, I believe that you are all conscious. I have no scientific evidence that you're all conscious. I have scientific evidence of your behaviors, but behaviors do not necessitate consciousness. That would be assuming what it is I'm trying to prove. Nonetheless, it's perfectly reasonable for me to believe that you're conscious. Why? Because I'm conscious and you behave enough like me. Well, that's called an argument from analogy. It's, an, it's a logical fallacy in formal logic. In informal logic, it's a fallacy. It does not give you like an absolute conclusion. It's considered to be fallacious reasoning. But somehow or other, I can't know what it's like if you're conscious or not because I can't be you. And conscious by its very definition is experienced subjectively in the first person. So I experience my own consciousness and I watch you carefully and I see that you seem to be like me and it's enough. And I'm like, hey, you know what? We talked, I looked in your eye. You know what? I'm going to accept it that everybody else is conscious like I am. Not everybody has a conscience. Interestingly enough, the word conscience, what's the word for conscience in Spanish? Conciencia. What's the word for consciousness in Spanish? Huh? Huh? Where were you born? Why are you looking at her? Where were you born? What are you doing? She's from here. You're from Mexico. What's the word from consciousness in Spanish? It's the same word. Isn't that interesting? I know the answer to my question. This is having fun with you guys. The word for consciousness and the word for conscience in Romance languages is the same. Conciencia in Italian. Same in Spanish, same in Portuguese. It's interesting. Anyway, although we're all conscious, not everybody has a conscience. Sociopaths, people with antisocial personality disorder, don't. But we assume everybody has a conscience, because we do. And it's freaky to learn that there's people in the world who don't have a conscience. You can figure it out, 
So even something where I'm studying you, there is no way I can empirically prove that you're conscious. I can prove that you behave in certain ways, but that's not the same as proving you're conscious. Consciousness is the internal experience of seeing the color red and feeling certain ways and having a perspective that's unique to you, and that can only be experienced in the first person. Therefore, it would never subject itself to a third person objective scientific inquiry. You cannot prove other people are conscious. conscious. But we all think they are. Are we all crazy? No, we're reasonable. There's just non-empirical ways of arriving at truth. We live in a world where there's non-empirical ways of arriving at truth. We live in a world where we believe all sorts of things which we could not prove in a laboratory. Perfectly reasonably. In fact, to live without believing other people were, were conscious would be bizarre. It would be almost indicative of a mental disorder. There's a philosophy that espouses called solipsism. But, but we can even go further than that and we can figure out if someone has a conscience within their consciousness. You have to do some testing. And of course, you can't prove this either. But somehow or other, we're able to understand all sorts of things about consciousness, about conscience, with ourselves, with other people, but we can't do so empirically. We do so through empathy, through analogy, through thoughtfulness, through reason, but not exactly rigorous scientific reason. And so when we're looking for a warrant for our belief system, when we're looking for what makes it worth it for us to jump into the, into the laboratory and do experiments, we should look for a good working hypothesis. We should look for good initial reasons. Once we have those, we should then perform this experiment. What's the experiment? We should love Krishna with our whole hearts. We should be yukta, satata, ever yoked. Bajata priti, but priti purvaka, according to love. And then we should investigate and wait to see if we become enlightened. We should then allow Krishna to work miracles in our life. And given that we believe in God, and given that we believe in spirituality, we should not be ashamed to report those things as also being evidence. They should not be the first thing we tell people about because then we sound like quackpots. But in a system, like if you start telling people about quantum mechanics without explaining classical mechanics and the differentiation of electromagnetism, electric charge, the experiments which were done with light, and it, it, starts, it just sounds, like, it's just sounds like, you know, like some kind of science fiction stuff. But if you explain it within context and you show the math, all of a sudden, although it's not deterministic and it's not 100%, it starts to become much, much more reasonable. Similarly, we should have a space in our own hearts for divine revelation. For Krishna reaching out and instilling us with wisdom. And we shouldn't be ashamed that that's part of our theology. Nor should the Christians, nor should the Jews, nor should the Muslims. We believe in God. We get to believe that God's going to inspire you. We can play atheist with you for a little bit and show that we can joust with you and we can win some rounds with you and we can show that we're just as good at that philosophy game as you are. But at a certain point, once somebody has some initial faith and some confidence in the experiment, we should be willing to do that experiment and really give ourselves over and let go and let God and see what happens and carefully watch. And that's why regularly I tell people, you know, why don't you come to the temple, do kirtan, cry out like a child cries out for its mother with full abandon. Don't hold anything back. Beg Krishna, but don't beg for something. Just beg for him. Just cry out Krishna in the same way you would cry out your lover's name or your loved one's name. 
And we even go further, we say cry out in separation. It creates even more intensity when you miss somebody. It makes you even more sincere. One of our teachers was teaching a class and he goes, we should cry out to Krishna in separation, we should cry out to Krishna, we should miss Krishna, we should learn the art of crying for Krishna. I'm opening a crying school to teach people how to cry for Krishna. And some person in the audience raised their hand, they're like, but I always feel Krishna's presence in my, in my life. Some young lady. And he said, that's okay. You're a beginner. That's okay. I understand. You're okay. That's very good. You're a beginner. He goes, eventually, someday, you'll begin to miss Krishna. <laughs> you want something subversive in our tradition? How's that for one? In the beginning, you feel Krishna's presence. As you get more advanced, you feel Krishna's presence less which makes you cry out more intensely and actually connects you to Krishna more. You actually become connected to Krishna more. And as you become connected to Krishna more, you miss him more and feel more bereft. And that feeling of bereftness purifies your heart. It, it, it. refines your gold-like heart and cooks off all the other metals. And in that fire of separation, your devotion becomes unalloyed and your love for Krishna becomes unalloyed. And so within our tradition, there's our responsibilities to have reasons for why we do what we do, to kick the tires, to do our due diligence, to be able to explain our faith to other people. But at a certain point, once we get in that laboratory and we come up with a reasonable hypothesis, we can then reasonably begin to talk about what it's like to experience God and look for common things in traditions troubleshoot stuff talk to elders compare it to our brethren and have that become a factor Krishna's reciprocity and in the same way that although we have no evidence no empirical evidence of how we know that people are conscious or how we know whether or not they have a conscience, somehow or other, we can do that math and we can diagnose people with antisocial personality disorder, we can treat them, we know everybody's conscious, and so similarly, we can all carefully embark on the subtle science journey of the self. And eventually feel and experience Krishna's mercy. And that's what he says here. That's what he says here. A person may have a bona fide spiritual master, may be attached to a spiritual organization, but if he is still not intelligent enough to make progress, then Krishna from within gives him instructions so he may ultimately come to him without difficulty. The qualification is that a person is always engaged in Krishna consciousness and with love and devotion renders all kinds of services. And that's a little bit of a snapshot of grace, how Krishna helps to span that gap. All right, I'm done. I made my points. Let's do a little kirtan. Thank you so very much. Hare Krishna.